So we are rapidly populating with participants. So I'll give a couple of minutes for that to settle down, everyone to come inside to our virtual auditorium. Good afternoon, everyone. Good morning to those of you on the other side of the United States. Good evening to those of you on another continent. Uh, thank you so much for joining us. Our book talk today is with Dr. Deborah Starr. Uh, this is the book here, Togo Mizrahi and the Making of Egyptian uh, Cinema, which she'll be talking about today. And we're really delighted to have her. Uh, Deborah Starr is Professor of Modern Arabic and Hebrew Literature and Film in the Department of Near Eastern Studies at Cornell University. She's also the Director of the Jewish Studies Program there. She received her PhD in comparative literature from the University of Michigan. And she is the author not only of this wonderful new book that we're going to be hearing about today, but also her earlier book is entitled Remembering Cosmopolitan Egypt, Literature, Culture, and Empire, published with Rutledge in 2009. And she's also the co-editor with Sasson Somech uh, of Mongrels and Marvels, uh, The Levantine Writings of Jacqueline Shochet Kahanaf from Stanford University Press in 2011. And she's written, uh, large number of articles in both uh, literature as well as film, uh, including on the Egyptian Coptic writer, uh, Anglophone writer, Wagi Ghali, uh, and was instrumental in, correct, in collecting, excuse me, his unpublished papers, diaries, and letters, um, and manuscript fragments, and those are housed, digitized and housed at Cornell University. Um, so she will be talking today um, about this new book. Uh, I just will bring to your attention that there is a discount code from the press uh, right now, 30% off. I think it will be in the chats uh, if you would like to purchase a copy. It's also free and open access for those of you who would like to read more about Togo Mizrahi. Um, and I do, just before we get started, want to thank our sponsors, uh, the Program in Jewish Studies here at Penn State University. So I'm going to turn it over to Deborah, um, and she will speak to us about her book and, and show us some wonderful film clips uh, that she is writing about, and then we'll open it up for Q&A after that. Thank you very much, Michelle. Um, thank you, Lior, for the introduction. Thank you, Michelle, for the introduction and Lior for the invitation. Um, and thank you to Penn State Jewish Studies for, for hosting me. Uh, what I'm going to talk about today, this is a story about a Jewish filmmaker um, who is a key player in founding the Egyptian film industry. Um, so I'm going to share some slides. Uh, there we go. Hopefully you are now seeing my screen. Today's talk is going to be an overview of the book. Um, the book is part biography of this Egyptian Jewish filmmaker. Togo Mizrahi, as I said, was one of the founders of the Egyptian film industry. He established a studio and a production company in Alexandria, and he started making films in 1930. Uh, and he became the most productive filmmaker in Egypt in the 1930s um, and remained a very productive uh, player in the industry um, until 1946. The book is also part Egyptian film history. Um, I'm particularly interested in how cinema of the 1930s and 40s um, and the cinema professionals from that period saw themselves engaged in a national project um, in producing a national culture. And I'm also interested in the involvement of Jews, minorities, foreigners, um, alongside their, uh, their counterparts, the um, Egyptian, Muslim, and Christian uh, filmmakers and uh, actors and whatnot. And finally, the book is also part film analysis, where I look closely at what Mizrahi is saying in his films um, and look at his work as a socially engaged filmmaker. Um, because this is hosted by a Jewish studies uh, program, I'm going to focus on Mizrahi's most visibly Jewish film, Al Ez Bahdala, uh, Mistreated by Affluence from 1937. Um, this is part of a series of films he made. Uh, uh, buddy films between characters named Shalom and Abdu, um, and it portrays friendships between Jews and Muslims in Alexandria. Um, and these films starred another a Jewish actor named Leon Angel, who went by the screen name Shalom. Together, Leon Angel and Togo Mizrahi 
create a particular vision of Jewish nativeness that I'll, I'll talk through. Um, it's not necessarily how Egyptian Jews saw themselves, uh, but it's an expression of belonging, of a pluralist nationalism at a time that Egypt was seeing uh, rising parochial nationalism. But since this is about movies, we're going to start with a clip. So um, this is uh, again from Mistreated by Affluence from 1937. Okay, this kinetic carnivalesque montage appears in a 1937 Egyptian feature film, Al Izbahtala, Mistreated by Affluence. A title screen identifies the celebration as Shaman Nassim, Eid Shab, Shaman Nassim, the People's Feast. The spring festival shares some characteristics with other seasonal celebrations in the region like Nowruz, but it is also a uniquely Egyptian festival with roots in ancient Egyptian practices. Egyptians take to the streets, parks, beaches, and green spaces. The footage shows what appear to be Alexandria residents engaged in leisure activities at identifiable locales. None of the credited actors appear in the montage. Children display curiosity about the camera. The viewer is invited to read these images as authentic, even as we recognize the constructedness of the montage. Social codes of dress give the viewer cues to categorizing the individuals included in the footage. Members of the rising middle class, the Effendia, are shown seeking entertainment and diversion alongside members of the popular classes. This carefully edited montage constructs a festival day in which Alexandrians across the socioeconomic spectrum celebrate in public spaces together. While the celebration of Sham and Nassim is pegged to the Coptic calendar, falling on the day after Easter, in modern times, it has historically been celebrated by Muslim, Christian, and Jewish Egyptians alike. The narrative scenes that bracket the montage highlight this intercommunal aspect of the festival. In the scene preceding the montage, two families, one Muslim and one Jewish, prepare together for the next day's feast. As the two mothers and their adult daughters package up the traditional Egyptian dishes they prepare for the picnic, the daughter's fiancés deliver fisikh, salted fish traditionally consumed on the holiday. In the scene that follows the montage, the two families picnic on the beach, literally breaking bread together. Read in tandem, the montage and the narrative scenes portray Shaman Nassim as a universal practice of all Egyptians, regardless of class or religion. Okay, I'm going to share my screen again, so please bear with me. Apologize for that delay. Oops, there we go. All right. Um, Mistreated by Affluence was written, directed, and produced by Togo Mizrahi, a Jewish native of Alexandria. Shaman Nassim holds great appeal for Mizrahi. Scenes from the festival feature prominently in three of his films, including Mistreated by Affluence. The holiday is both distinctly Egyptian and universally celebrated in Egypt. The communal celebration of the festival enacts a pluralist vision of the Egyptian polity that Togo Mizrahi projects in his films. Togo Mizrahi was the most prolific filmmaker of his day. Over the course of his productive 16-year career in the Egyptian film industry from 1930 to 1946, he directed and produced 30 Arabic language feature films, most of which he also wrote. In addition to his contributions to Egyptian cinema and Arabic, he also produced four Greek language films. By telling the story of Togo Mizrahi, a Jew born in Alexandria, this book also tells the history of Egyptian Jews in the 20th century. Although Mizrahi came from a family that could trace its roots back several generations, he never held Egyptian nationality. In 1946, he was accused of providing technical support to a Zionist film. He left Egypt and settled in Rome. In the 1960s, Mizrahi's production company was sequestered and his films and property were seized. Over the following decades, even though his films remained popular, Mizrahi's legacy faded alongside the memory of Jewish history and culture in Egypt. In my book, I recuperate the life and work of this important filmmaker and explore Jewish contribution to Egyptian mass culture. Even though Mizrahi never held Egyptian citizenship or Egyptian nationality, 
He identified with the Egyptian national struggle at a time when Great Britain continued to wield significant power in Egypt. In the 1930s and 40s, Egyptian filmmakers, critics, and audiences viewed locally produced cinema as a source of national pride, as a way to combat foreign cultural domination. In 1929, Mizrahi chose to name his newly founded production company, Shariket El Iflam El Misriya, the Egyptian Films Company. Promotional materials from Mizrahi's films tapped into the audience's desire to see locally produced cinema. For example, an advertisement touted a 1935 film of Bahar, the sailor, the sailor, as a film, quote, a film of the Egyptian popular classes that showed the true face of Egypt. After 1939, Mizrahi's films sported a logo that prominently featured a crest uh, bearing a crescent and three stars, the symbol of the kingdom of Egypt. And this is what we're looking at here. Uh, a later modification, which is on the bottom um, as part of the, um, the letterhead, a later modification of the company's logo visually integrated cinema and nationalist sentiment. A length of film spools out from the words Egyptian Films Company winding three times around the crest. In the 1930s, Mizrahi was involved in attempts at forming industry syndicates to agitate for state protection of the nascent Egyptian film industry. Later in his career, Mizrahi took, the press, took to the press to raise public awareness of issues hampering the development of Egyptian cinema. Mizrahi was both an artist and a businessman who saw himself contributing to building both a local art form and a domestic industry. The Egyptian cinema industry of the 1930s was comprised of a diverse mix of Egyptians, Mutamasirun, and foreigners. It should come as no surprise that the Egypt reflected in these films portrayed an inclusive notion of national belonging. Mizrahi's films are emblematic of this phenomenon, but he's not alone. Other films produced in this era, included, uh, including some produced by Studio Misser and by Asya Dagger's Lotus Films also reflect this diversity. In both comedies and musicals, Mizrahi utilized his films as a platform for addressing social issues, from income inequality to the changing roles of women in Egyptian society. Mizrahi's comedies from the 1930s use masquerade and convoluted plots of mistaken identity to challenge the categories of ethno-national identity as well as of gender and race. I use the term Levantine to describe these movies. I have identified three common characteristics of what I term a Levantine cinematic idiom. First, Levantine films represent an ethics of coexistent, coexistence. Second, they construct a pluralist aesthetic. Finally, in true Levantine fashion, these films treat identity as fluid. The Levantine ethics of coexistence evident in Mizrahi's films challenges parochial nationalism. I argue that Mizrahi's bedroom farces from the 1930s destabilize gender categories and critique the normativization of bourgeois Egyptian modernity. I also argue that Mizrahi's musical melodramas of the 1940s push the boundaries of the Egyptian nation and national identity. So what I'd like to do now is give you a taste of what's going on in his films um, and how I'm reading them. And I'll do this by looking at um, the character of Shalom in that same film, uh, Mistreated by Affluence, and the re representation of Egyptian Jewishness um, in the films they made together. Okay, and I'm going to uh, share my screen once again. Uh, so please bear with me. Let us return to where we began, Togo Mizrahi's 1937 film, Mistreated by Affluence. In this film, a boarded up shop front is plastered with advertisements for Mizrahi's earlier film, Aulad Misr. Here we go. Uh, these, these, uh, it, uh, Aulad Misr is uh, translated as Children of Egypt and the film was released in 1933. These posters have a promotional purpose. Films would circulate in cinemas long after the release date the signs read, Togo Mizrahi presents Children of Egypt. But the word presents is written in such small letters in both Arabic and French that it is barely visible. 
So in the brief moment when the sign is visible, what catches the eye is Togo Mizrahi and children of Egypt. Mizrahi, the Jewish director, wishes to identify himself and Shalom, um, who as we see in the, this, this, the, the second picture here, Shalom, whose sign later graces the shop as children of Egypt. These posters for children of Egypt appearing within a film about friendships between Muslims and Jews uh, assert an inclusive notion of nativeness. The title, Aulad Misr, evokes an Egyptian colloquial term that is used to describe the urban lower classes, Aulad al balad uh, This is uh, Ibn al balad is the masculine singular, Bint al balad is the feminine singular. In popular usage, the term Ibn or Bint al balad signifies simplicity, goodness, and purity of heart. The terms Ibn or Bint al balad function as markers of both indigeneity and class. The notion of Aulad al balad possesses a self-reflexive and performative quality. Uh, an anthropologist, Sausen al Masiri, who conducted fieldwork in Egypt in the late 1960s and early 1970s, um, interviewed a craftsman who self-identified as Ibn al balad This craftsman recalls how Aulad al balad of the previous generation used to attend the theater, especially the plays of Nagib al rihani and Ali al-Kassar. In other words, according to this informant, in the early 20th century, Aulad al balad were in part defined by their attendance at performances that shaped and defined their sense of self. Togo Mizrahi was actively engaged in perpetuating and disseminating this performance of identity. Although Mizrahi and Nagib al rihani never made a film together, al rihanis longtime writing partner, Badia Khairi, collaborated with Mizrahi on several films. Ali al a quintessential Ibn al balad of this stage, worked extensively with Togo Mizrahi. Mizrahi was instrumental in helping al Kassar bring to the screen his popular stage persona, Osman Abdel Basit, a down on his luck Nubian. Between 1936 and 1944, al Kassar starred in nine films directed by Mizrahi. Mizrahi's socially conscious films draw attention to the struggles of the urban lower classes. In these films, Mizrahi also expands the notion of nativeness to include Jews. The terms Ibn or Bint al balad have generally only applied to the Muslim majority. Togo Mizrahi's Shalom and Abdu films um, include lower class Arabic speaking Jews as Aulad al balad Shalom was the screen name and on-screen persona of Leon Angel, an Alexandrian Jew of Greek nationality. Angel hailed from the same lower class quarter as his character inhabits on screen. According to family lore, Leon's father smuggled drugs and spent a, his earnings at brothels. Leon was charged with supporting his family from a young age. He drew on his family's experiences in collaborating with Mizrahi on the script for his first film, Al Hawiya Al Kokain, The Abyss or Cocaine from 1930. Angel's character, Shalom, challenges commonly held assumptions about, about both nativeness and Jewishness in 1930s Egypt. Shalom sells lottery tickets in the streets and cafes. His sidekick, Abdu, is a butcher's assistant who suffers at the hands of his employer. The only thing that sets the Shalom films apart from the other contemporaneous representations of Aulad al balad is their inclusion of Jews. In addition to broadening the notion of nativeness held by the populace at large, Shalom also unsettles perceptions of Arabic speaking lower class Jews held by the Francophone Jewish bourgeoisie. In dress and speech, Shalom shares traits common among the Jews from the popular districts in Cairo and Alexandria. Members of the Jewish bourgeoisie and those with upwardly mobile bourgeois aspirations spoke French and dressed in Western fashion. The Egyptian Jewish bourgeoisie looked down upon the poverty and traditional values characteristics of the residents of Harat al Yehud, Cairo's medieval quarter. Many also spurned the use of Arabic. They never saw themselves as embracing the option that Shalom represents. A response to Shalom's on screen persona that appeared in the Jewish press illustrates and complicates this divide. Following the release of Mistreated by Affluence, um, again, this is 1937, 
a reader of the Arabic language Egyptian Jewish newspaper Ashams named Raphael Moseri wrote a letter to the editor complaining that the film debases Jews. While he appreciated the portrayal of amity between two Egyptian families living in Egypt, one Jewish and the other Muslim, Moseri found Shalom's behavior a disgrace to the community. Shalom steals meat from the butcher shop where Abdu works. At moments in the film, his character comes across as petulant, selfish, and stingy. Moseri implores Mizrahi to use his great talent to avoid depicting Jewish characters with such shortcomings. Moseri writes, and I quote from his uh, letter to the editor, it is incumbent upon Mizrahi as a Jew to show the virtues of his fellow Jews, ennobling their appearance on the silver screen. Moseri, an Arabic speaking Jew engaged in the public sphere of the Arabic Jewish press, published his views in a journal that advocated for the integration of Jews into Egyptian culture, yet Moseri rejects Shalom. The Jewish Ibn al-Dalid is not the role model he wishes to see on screen. Moseri, however, misses the point. Shalom was not a figure for emulation. Like Charlie Chaplin's Tramp, Shalom holds up a mirror to society. Shalom, the Ibn al-Dalid, reflects Togo Mizrahi and Leon Angel's desire to articulate a particular vision of Jewish belonging within Egypt. The character Shalom boldly inserts lower class Arabophone Egyptian Jewish nativeness into the cultural imaginary. So as you can see um, from, from this reading of this character, Mizrahi uh, was interested in Egyptian society um, and I, I consider him to be a socially engaged filmmaker. Um, so what I'd like to do now is to, to talk through some of the other social issues um, that his films address and that I talk about in, in my book. Shalom is the only explicitly Jewish character in Togo Mizrahi's films. But Mizrahi made several very successful musicals with Egyptian Jewish singer Leila Morad. The first of those films uh, pictured here, uh, Leila Mumtara, A Rainy Night from 1939, reflects distinctly Jewish anxieties, even though it lacks explicit Jewish content. The film counterposes rising fascism in Europe with Egypt's Levantine and multiracial society. Mizrahi's films also engage with gender and sexuality. The lower class characters in Mizrahi's films are ill at ease with middle class expectations and with emerging gender norms. In the book, I argue that through their narratives of mistaken identity, two of Mizrahi's films queer both gender and ethno-religious identities. Mistreated by Affluence, pictured here on the left, a screenshot from the film, opens with Shalom and Abdu waking up together in a shared bed. Starting with this image, I analyze the interrelationship between the ethics of coexistence and the destabilized performative gender identities in that film, as well as in Dr. Farhat, Dr. Farhat from 1935, from which the second image here, the one on the right, is taken. Um, his films also touch on race and national identity. In the 1937 comedy, Isa'a seven o'clock, Ali Kassar masquerades as a Nubian woman, pushing boundaries of gender, race, and national identity. And you can see a, a screenshot of that film on the bottom right. In the film, Al Kassar reprises his signature role as Osman Abdel Basit. Al Kassar had previously performed his character Osman on stage in blackface when we see here a, um, uh, an image uh, caricature from a, a magazine, a contemporaneous journal. I analyzed the vestigial blackface associated with this character and unpack the implications of this association on the film's performance of Egyptian identity. And last but not least, Mizrahi's films engage uh, with gender roles in Egyptian society. In the early 20th century, there were significant shifts in the role of women in the Egyptian public sphere. Women were among the strong advocates, for example, for the abolition of legalized prostitution in Egypt, a product of British colonial rule. Mizrahi produced a pair of musicals in the 1940s that, as I read them, engage with this public conversation about public, of female sexuality and national honor. 
These films featured two of the biggest female stars in 1940s Egypt, Leila Mourad and Um Kulthum. Um, in Leila from 1942, uh, which was an adaptation of Alexander Dumas' novel, uh, La Dame aux Camélia, Leila Mourad starred in the role of a courtesan. Uh, Egyptian diva Um Kulthum, pictured here, uh, throughout her career, preferred appearing in historical films. In 1945, she starred in Salama, directed by Togo Mizrahi as a singing slave girl, Akhena. Mizrahi uses his signature Levantine comedic idiom to defang the threats to Salama's honor posed by some of the men in the film. Togo Mizrahi was somewhat media shy, but in the 1940s, he occasionally contributed columns to the Arabic language general interest journal Sabah. I would like to conclude by hearing some of uh, Mizrahi's words in his, uh, his own words um, and by looking at two essays he published in 1942. In one optimistically titled essay, Egyptian Cinema Production is the Best in the World, Mizrahi attempts to debunk claims levied by a critic who, citing limited box office returns, expressed concern about the commercial viability of the Egyptian film industry. Mizrahi counters with a manifesto of sorts, revealing his commitment to the growth and financial health of Egyptian cinema. And here I quote from his article, we people and producers must all be soldiers in solidarity, standing shoulder to shoulder for the sake of the Egyptian film Renaissance so that we can achieve someday in the future, the perfection sought by the Egyptian people and the brotherly people who also see these films. God alone is the arbiter of success. So in this article, Mizrahi sees his filmmaking efforts as part of a national project with a pan-Arab gloss, right? So these films are being circulated um, throughout uh, the Arab Arabic speaking countries. He grants much of the success of the film industry to the audience for turning out in large numbers to support local production. The second article, The History of Egyptian Cinema, provides some data to back up his optimism about the industry. But as the title suggests, he begins by discussing the development of cinema in Egypt. Uh, the article begins, and I quote here, uh, cinema production in Egypt began before the Great War. In 1913, the first studio was established in Alexandria, end quote. And I'll summarize now, as, as films in the first two decades of the 20th century were produced in glass structures and were lit by sunlight, Mizrahi notes that the conditions in Egypt were advantageous for cinema production. Mizrahi relates that an Italian company founded the first studio and production company in Egypt, um, Sitzia, but the effort was short-lived. He then honors Ali Kassar, Aziza Amir, and Mohammed Karim, as well as the Lama brothers for their contribution to early cinema production in the 1920s. According to Mizrahi, since the establishment of the cinema industry in its current form, beginning in his estimation in 1929, it has become an important engine for the Egyptian economy. Now, Mizrahi does not get all of the historical facts straight. Aziz Bandarli and Umberto Doris uh, Doris established a studio in 1907, not 1913. And by the way, we, this um, this portrait we have of Togo Mizrahi was taken in Doris's studio as he was the photographer. Sitzia, the Italian cinema, Cinematographic Society, was founded in 1917, again, not 1913. However, the article provides insights into how Mizrahi viewed Egyptian cinema history. First, Mizrahi identifies Alexandria as the site of the first locally produced films. By Mizrahi's account, the studio era starts in 1929 before the establishment of Studio Misser in 1934, an event often lauded as the true beginning of the Egyptian and cinema industry. Ms. Rahi also sees foreigners and non-citizen residents as an integral part of the history of Egyptian cinema. By contrast, the dominant narratives of Egyptian cinema history are Cairo-centric and very narrowly define what it means for a film to be considered Egyptian. The second half of the article reflects Mizrahi's public relations efforts on behalf of the cinema industry as a whole. In 1942, according to Mizrahi, there were 20 film production companies in Egypt, 10 of which were committed to producing films full time and year round. The six largest studios operated a total of 10 sound stages and between them employed approximately 1000 people, including hundreds of artisans and technicians. 
By Mizrahi's accounting, the industry poured 500,000 Egyptian pounds into the economy annually and paid 40,000 Egyptian pounds to the government in taxes. According to Mizrahi, locally produced films dominated the cinemas in 1942, especially outside of the big cities, although it is worth noting that World War II suppressed distribution of Hollywood and European films in Egypt um, and imports of these foreign films resumed after the war. Mizrahi cites international demand for Egyptian films as another marker of industry success. He provides a long list of countries where Egyptian films are distributed in 1942. Mizrahi caps off his boosterism of the film industry by signing the article as a member of the board of directors of the Egyptian Chamber of Commerce, Giza Directorate. Notably, Mizrahi does not write himself into this narrative of Egyptian cinema history. In this article and in his other published pieces, Mizrahi neither takes credit for his role in founding the industry nor his contributions to its subsequent growth. Nevertheless, in addition to being a prolific director and producer, Togo Mizrahi played an active role in developing the cinema industry in the 1930s and 1940s. Mizrahi was involved in efforts to establish professional syndicates in cinema. He used his influence to lobby parliament for industry protection. As a business owner, he joined the Chamber of Commerce to advocate on behalf of the local cinema industry. When he spoke to the press, he used his success not to promote his own films, but rather to represent the industry as a whole. In his published essays, he touted the achievements of Egyptian cinema and raised public awareness of issues hampering the development of the Egyptian cinema industry, particularly drawing attention to the challenges facing independent studios. He also used the press to pressure cinemas to screen more locally produced films and to engage in business practices that would encourage a development of a range of local idioms. Mizrahi always casts his promotion of cinema's cultural and economic potential in patriotic terms. He viewed his role as director, producer, and studio owner as contributing to the endeavor of building a viable and vibrant film industry in Egypt in the 1930s and 40s. The success of Mizrahi's films can in part be attributed to his ability to attract some of the best talent in Egypt, both in front of and behind the camera. He brought to the silver screen popular veteran actors of the stage like Ali Kassar, Fawzi al-Ghazayerli, Yusuf Wahbi, and Amina Rizk. Mizrahi's musicals feature some of the top recording artists of the era. He directed what is widely regarded as Um Kulthum's best performance on screen. Mizrahi's name is closely linked to Leila Murad, who over the five films they made together became a huge box office success. He fostered the performances of actors whose careers blossomed in the 1940s and 50s, such as Ismail Yassin, Tahir Karioka, Akila Ratab, and Anwar Wagdi. All of these stars continue to draw audiences. As the contemporaneous box office successes and contemporary popularity on YouTube attest, Togo Mizrahi produced movies with enduring, enduring audience appeal. The Egyptian films, of this Jewish, Italian, Egyptian filmmaker continue to delight generations of audiences in Egypt and around the world. Thank you very much. Bravo, thank you so much, Debra. Thank you, uh, it took me a minute to get my... <laughs> camera on and unmuted, but thank you so much for that delightful talk. Um, I want to invite everyone to, if you have questions, comments, please put them in the Q&A box. We already have a couple. Um, and if that's okay, I'll just read um, each in turn out to you, Deborah. Thank you. Uh, first from Tanya Goldman, thank you for this talk. What a fascinating topic. For several years, I have taught a survey course entitled uh, or titled International Cinema to 1960 and been working hard to integrate works from outside the European and Japanese canon. It can sometimes be hard to get access to works outside of these regions and even harder with subtitles. I'd love to talk about Togo Mizrahi if I teach the course again. Are they available digitally? How might I access them? And this is going to permit you to, to expand a little bit on your um, comments about YouTube and the dominance of these films there. Sure, thank you. Thank you very much for that question. Um, so th this is, uh, I, I, there, there's one film available 
Um, that is uh, Togo Mizrahi's, uh, I believe it's 1941 film with Leila Morad called Leila the Schoolgirl. So that was re released on a DVD with uh, English subtitles and uh, there, it's definitely available through some libraries uh, in the US. Um, you know, and so you would, you might be able to access it. I'm not sure if it's still commercially available if your library would still be able to purchase it. Um, but that is one that I know has been commercially released um, and could be used in an educational setting. A lot of these films broadcast all the time on um, on satellite television, on some of the classic movie stations. They're still very popular um, on, on national televisions. In Egypt, they still you know broadcast uh, you know as part of again old movies uh, afternoon in the afternoon time slot. Uh, but very few of them have ever been, you know, shown with subtitles. Um, and so I think, you know, if you're, if you're trying to teach them in a context where it requires subtitles, unfortunately, that's um, the only one. But uh, they've been loaded uh, to YouTube, although it's, it's, very, it's a very unstable sort of archive because things go up and come down. Um, they'll go up with ads and come down. And they, so they're, um, you know, it's, the, the, it's, it's sort of, again, user sourced. And so um, it's a real treasure trove when they show up there. But... Um, it's not really a stable, stable archive for these films. Thank you. Um, we have a question from Valerie Frankel. Any fantasy or fairy tale films, films by Mizrahi? And perhaps you can uh, talk a little bit more about genre more broadly. And if we think about the melodrama, is that not a fairy tale in and of itself? Um, <laughs> see what your opinion is on that. Thank you. Um, so, so he makes a number of what I call costume comedies um, in the early 1940s, um, particularly with this with Ali Kassar. Um, and so these are sort of um, based very loosely on the Thousand and One Nights, um, you know, where you have these these sort of very um, you know elaborate kind of costumes. Um, and you know, going into kingdoms and palaces and princesses and all of this uh, love stories, and they always have a musical element to them. Uh, and so, uh, so these are uh, some of these were not very well received at the time. Um, they were seen as kind of lowbrow humor, but um, but they do sort of hold up. Um, they, you know, they always have some sort of cross-dressing element, um, and they're they're pretty fun romps through. Uh, you know, through this, uh, you know, kind of crossing genres where you have a comedy with a little bit of musical and a little bit of costume and, you know, a big, big production. So, um, so I think that's the closest that would, it would come, but certainly with, with mel melodramatic musicals, um, you have figures, uh, you know, that take place in court culture, right? So, um, so when we talk about Salama, Um Kulsum's uh, musical from 1945, um, you know, sort of she she's a slave, but you see her moving through one court uh, after another um, up until she gets uh, to the court of the Sultan. And so so you have this this kind of, again, this sort of fairy tale story of, um, you know, her growing popularity as a performer um, from one, you know, from one household to another, from one court culture to another. Thank you. Uh, Bridget Halpin asks. Uh, what is your favorite Togo Mizrahi film and why? And she comments, it's a fasc fascinating presentation. So I want to make sure that. <laughs> Thank you. That. Oh, that's such a hard one. <laughs> that's the hardest possible question. Um, I, I certainly keep coming back to, uh, you know, to Mistreated by Affluence um, because it, it illustrates so many of the things that interest me. Um, and it's, you know, and it's comic and uh, it's, it's a lot of fun to watch. Um, I, I think I think I'm really drawn to the comedies, uh, even though I also love the musicals. Um, uh, one that I, I particularly enjoyed writing about was uh, Seven O'Clock. Um, this is this this uh, movie where uh, Ali Kassar, uh, again, pretty lowbrow humor, but it it, it it moves through these. He's he he um, he dreams that uh, he, he well he. Uh, his bike is stolen. He walks around the city. He, he sort of he's, he's, he works he works walking around the city, and um, he then ends up dreaming um, that this money that he ends up holding onto that he couldn't deliver to a customer 
um, at the end of the day, because he had to go on foot, um, he dreams that that gets stolen. And the rest of the film is basically this dream sequence that gets more and more improbable <laughs> as he goes along. Um, and he ends up, you know, dressing as this Nubian woman. And so it just, it goes, you know, completely off the rails. Um, but it's really, really fascinating when he goes um, to visit his family in Aswan and we see some really interesting um, interplay with race um, as well as the sort of gender stuff. And so it's, it's a, it's a pretty trippy comedy, but it has uh, it has a lot a lot of meat to it. So that might be another one on my list. Um, I'll take the the next one. Um, anonymous attendee asks, uh, "Have you found any mention of uh, Um Kulthum's relationship uh, to Jews more broadly, both in her film with Mizrahi and more broadly?" No, I'm afraid I have not. Um, all right, that's, <laughs> that's an answer. <laughs> no, I wish I had more to say. Um, uh, you know, I think, um, so, I mean, the, the one thing I can say is um, uh, a few years before she agrees, you know, she signs this contract to work with Ms. Rahi, and, you know, and it's sort of interesting, um, an interesting collaboration because um, this is the one film where Mizrahi really um, is collaborating with a, another writer. Um, it's a, a literary, you know, it's a literary adaptation, which is also true of, of Leila. Um, but uh, he's 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 not producing the film. He's not the writer. Um, he, he's just directing the film. And so, um, you know, it's it's a really it's 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 sort of a standout in his um, in his oeuvre because he he mostly either you know writes produces. And and directs the films, or he's you know he's collaborating on writing, or one of the one of the actors wrote the film, and so that there it's sort of kept inside. And this is this is a you know a, a really big budget production that's um, involves a lot of people. Uh, but before she makes this film, um, she went to there's a report you know in the little you know sort of uh, gossip columns about how she goes to see uh, the film Layla Layla Murad starring as. Um, you know, as Camille, as the, you know, the, the, the courtesan in um, this, you know, based on this famous novel. And this, the story goes that he, you know, this, this was a kind of Egyptianization of the, the narrative. And it's set um, in Egypt in the 1890s. And um, again, sort of costume drama. Uh, but it's, it's, a, it's a, a sort of cultural interpretation of the, the narrative. Um, and so what you know, what she says, uh, what she's quoted as saying to her friend, having watched this movie in the theater is, he really succeeded in Egyptianizing this film. Like, I didn't think he could possibly do it, but he really does. And she, you know, cites an example from the film. And so, you know, so we have, you know, that I'm not sure that that really reveals very much, but um, it does, uh, you know, it does say something about this, this idea of like taking this, you know, this foreign text, Egyptianizing it, um, and the ways that he, he really captures um, you know, something, you know, quintessentially Egyptian in, in the film, at least in her view. Okay, thanks. Um, Joyce Zonana asks, uh, thanks for this wonderful talk. You read us uh, Musseri's critique of the character of Shalom, uh, where there are celebrations of the character of either Egyptian Jews or Muslims or Copts. I, I'm sorry, I missed the very last bit of that. Could you read that last sentence of the question? I'm Are there sorry. celebrations of that character by either Egyptian Jews or Muslims or Copts? Thank you. So celebrations, was that celebration yeah. of the character? Um, the, uh, the films do have, uh, you know, get a certain amount of, um, amount of coverage. Um, you know, Mizrahi's early films while he was still producing in Alexandria. So he, his studio was based in Alexandria up until 1939, at which point he relocates to Cairo, which has really become the center of film production in Egypt, um, you know, by that point. And um, in the early years, um, his, his films from the, the early to mid 1930s did not get a lot of press because the press was based in Cairo. And so, you know, films were showing first in Alexandria. Um, and so it's really, um, you know, so his first Shalom and Abdu film, for example, uh, is not covered very heavily in the press. But by the time we get to 1937, um, with uh, Mistreated by Affluence, we see a little bit more. Um, and there's, you know, there's certainly, um, you know, some reviews of the film, positive reviews of the film, um, you know, positive uh, characterizations of, of Shalom. Shalom um, also sort of branches out on his own. Um, and uh, makes a couple of films on his own, um, you know, produced by, one I think was produced by Togo Mizrahi, um, 
but uh, and the other I think uh, was produced elsewhere. But he, you know, he he does have um, you know this this presence um, independent of his relationship with Togo Mizrahi and. Um, and there's this really wonderful his, a, a promo picture from one of his films appears colorized on the back cover of one of, of uh, or um, you know, in, in, in the year that it, you know, right before it was coming out. So, so we had this like really lovely picture of Shalom that's colorized. Um, and so, so, you know, so they're fully accepted by, um, you know, by the Egyptian press. Um, you know, things get um, a little stickier in the 40s, um, you know, certainly after these these accusations are levied against Togo Mizrahi. But, um, you know, but up until that point, um, you know, it's it's common knowledge that he's Jewish, that Leila Murad is Jewish, um, that Shalom was Jewish. Um, but it's it's not made that the press doesn't make a big, big issue of it fundamentally. Yeah. Thanks. That actually connects with a couple of the uh, coming questions. Uh, so first, very briefly, uh, by Mustafa Hussein, he, to follow up on the Shalom question, what do you make of the fact that many Egyptian observers thought he wasn't funny enough? Uh, and then to connect to al Heckman's question, um, uh, to expand a little bit more on what you were just saying about the Egyptian com Jewish community uh, and how they embraced his films or not, whether or not there was a difference in their reception versus a broader Egyptian-wide reception. Um, you want to speak a little bit more on what his relationship to his Jewish Jewishness was? Okay, so um, the first question. Um, well, I what I'll say is that comedy in general was was generally poorly received. <laughs> that um, that Ali Kassar's films were panned off most of them and did not have huge box office success in their first run. Although, as we can see. Um, you know, we have one of these, you know, up for what a year on YouTube uh, that now garners a million views. And so, you know, I'm not sure, you know, I think <laughs> in some ways these films, the comedies perhaps, um, you know, gain traction over time. Um, but the the real, you know, the, the, the films that are most popular that garner the most, uh, you know, box office receipts in the first run uh, were the musicals. And I mean, that's where the Egyptian you know, audience really flocked to, to pay full price to see the movies. Um, and again, these movies would, would go into second run, third run and just keep circulating in the 30s because there wasn't a lot of new, um, new production. And so, you know, so they would gather, they would garner some success. So yes, I, I absolutely agree that the, criti the, the, the critics don't love the, the comedies in general and, and Shalom is certainly part of that. Um, I think uh, that um, audiences also, again, aren't necessarily willing to go out and pay a full price ticket um, to see the comedies. Um, and so this, you know, so it, it's it, it's sort of from both ends. Um, but I'm not sure uh, I would entirely agree that that Shalom was um, was deemed less funny. But he, I, I think I, I think fundamentally, it's it is also true. He's trying to he's trying very hard to be like Charlie Chaplin, and um, you know, and these films very much have a message, and and people you know don't necessarily like to have their comedies sort of hitting them over the head with the message of coexistence. And so, I mean, it's it's not heavy handed, but I I, I think that that may sort of <laughs> contribute to it. Um, whereas the you know the Ali Kassar films or the Fauzi Gazerli films certainly have a social consciousness. Um, but they're, you know, they're they're definitely a little bit more sort of out there. Um, and then I think the other question was about uh, Togo Mizrahi's Jew identification with Jewishness. Is that was that the second question? Okay. His reception uh, of the community. So um, I don't have a lot of um, documentation on this. Um, he appears in like the Who's Who document, you know, the the annual books of. Um, you know, of leading Jewish figures. Um, you know, his family was certainly um, among the Alexandrian elites. Um, but I, I have no, you know, he, he, his birth certificate was issued by, uh, you know, the, uh, the rabbinate of Alexandria. Um, but other than that, I have, I have zero documentation of any kind of family relationship uh, with, you know, with any of the, the Jewish community. Um, or, or particular Jewish celebration of, um, you know, you know, of his success, um, with the exception of, I mean, so this, this, this criticism by Moseri that I quote um, is a bit of an outlier. Um, the, the, the letters to the editor in, um, in the Shams from the 40s 
about the collaborations with Leila Murad are gush. They, they just love those movies and they're really happy to see her on screen and him behind the camera. And so, um, you know, so there's certainly a sense of pride uh, among the Jewish community, but as far as any sort of um, meaningful association uh, with the, um, the Jewish community of Egypt, um, there may be documents in the, um, in the synagogue, you know, papers, but those have been very difficult to get to. Um, we have a couple of questions about the his post Egypt uh, trajectory. So, uh, what did he do when he went to Rome, and and how did he fit into both the Jewish community there and the cinema community there? Um, and then um, Shai Chaskani wants us to know wants to know a little bit more about the accusations made against him in the context of a system Zionism, and whether or not he was vindicated in the same way that Leila Morat later was. Thank you. Okay, so I'll take the second question first. Um, so what happens is um, another, uh, another, a Jewish journalist, um, Albert Mizrahi, um, who kind of saw his job as smoking out Zionists in the Jewish midst, um, printed a story that Mizrahi was collaborating on these two, uh, two films, uh, these two Zionist films. Um, uh, um, and these are both films that had um, a potential need for dubbing. And his studio was capable of dubbing. Um, there were a few studios in Egypt. He doesn't exactly finger Mizrahi, but from that moment on, Mizrahi is blackballed by the industry. Um, and even before this happens, um, so he, he uh, in, in 1937, he, he married a woman he met. He was, he was constantly back and forth to Italy. Um, he met a woman on one of those trips and they got married. Um, and so she was Italian. She came to live in Egypt with him, but she didn't have deep roots there. You know, she was Italian, Italian. He's, you know, Italian, Egyptian. And, um, you know, so they're, they're in Egypt throughout World War II. And then after the war, they go and they, they, they buy, buy um, a, a, an apartment in Rome. And so they, they sort of back and forth uh, in, you know, in the late 40s. Um, and uh, you know, are sort of establishing themselves in Rome, coming back to Egypt. Um, but you know, after 1946, after these accusations come out, um, they they're basically located in Rome. Um, but in 1949, he comes back to Egypt uh, to try to um, make a comeback. And there are some indications that um, this might succeed. He gets a lot of press for this. Um, you know, that he's back. He's already started shooting some you know some background footage in. In, um, uh, in Italy and like, he's ready to go and it goes nowhere. And so as far as like, you know, vindication and whatnot, um, I think I think fundamentally he's, he's, he continues to be blackballed by the industry, even though his return suggests that um, some potential, you know, partners in, in filmmaking uh, were amenable to having him return. So it's, you know, it's not totally clear um, to me exactly what happened and whether the accusations were legitimate um, or not, like whether he was, I mean, I, certainly whether they're legit, you know, whether he was in fact in the conversation about dubbing these films, um, you know, you know, shouldn't lead to his, the, the destruction of his career, but, um, you know, whether there was any truth to them or not, I have no idea. Um, and, you know, whether there was any kind of vindication um, in, in any sort of official way, no. But what I should say is, that you know, when Egyptian television goes online, one of the things that is broadcast are old movies. And his movies were broadcast from the very beginning of Egyptian television, even during you know, sort of the height of um, animosity between Egypt and Israel. Um, and you know, again, with this background of his uh, being, having been accused of um, collaborating with uh, Zionist filmmakers, um, uh, but his, 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 the title card with his name was removed. So his films would continue um, but he was, his name was removed. After the Egypt and Israel peace accords, um, his films begin to be broadcast with his title card, with his name attributed. Um, and so there is a little bit of a recuperation at that moment. Um, but but the, the bottom line is that people remember the stars, they don't remember the filmmakers. Um, the public is, you know, they know the Leila Murad films, they may know Shalom, they certainly know Ali Kassar. And so, um, you know, people's associations with these films you know, might not necessarily know very much about Togo Mizrahi at all. Um, and then the other question, please remind me. 
um, his activities and reception in Rome and his integration of the Jewish community? It's kind of a black hole. Um, I've, I've had contact with, um, with his family um, and, you know, uh, I think the line is essentially that, you know, he pursued his many interests. Uh, he had some contact with the film industry in Rome, but he never made another movie. Um, and he was sort of a generous supporter of uh, members of his family who were in trouble, um, of his siblings who end up in Paris. Um, but he essentially retires. <laughs> and, uh, um, you know, by all accounts, he was he was happy and generous and well liked. Um, but there, there's no, you know, sort of nothing to sort of professionally sink our teeth into. Great. We do have two more questions that I want to make sure we get a chance to address. Um, first, from Anna Stanton here at, at Penn State. Um, if you're familiar with the 2015 uh, Egyptian Ramadan Mosal Suhara al Yehud, do you have any thoughts on how the show represents to Egyptian Jewish identity in the 1940s versus how it was portrayed by filmmakers actually working during that era? More generally, do you see legacies of the earlier representations of Egyptian Jewish characters that you study extending into Egyptian cinema or literature today? So um, I haven't seen the Musalsal. It's like on my to watch list. <laughs> so I can't comment on that directly, but it is very much a part of um, a sort of renaissance in nostalgia for cosmopolitan Egypt. And this is something that's been going on. I mean, in my first book, uh, Remembering Cosmopolitan Egypt, I track this as it starts appearing um, in the late 20th century in the 80s and 90s. Um, but it continues, and there are um, quite a number of, not just in Egypt, but in the, the Arab world broadly, um, young writers who are who had no personal relationships with the Jewish communities of their countries, um, writing about um, about this past, um, and so it's a very very interesting phenomenon. Um, there have been you know films, there have been. Um, uh, the television series um, and and a number of novels uh, that have dealt with this. So so I do see that as part of a broader cultural phenomenon um, and um, how accurately they're portrayed. I mean, I think this some of, this is actually some of how I got into this project was because I had studied the nostalgia in the late twentieth century and I wanted to know what the, the sort of the opposite of that. What did this actually look like in practice uh, in Egypt? And I had looked at both literature and film. And it was much more interesting to go back and look at it in the film industry than in literature, in part because um, people were writing in different languages and they weren't necessarily reading one another. Um, whereas the film industry people is, is fundamentally collaborative. You don't you have this sort of vision of the writer who's like alone in their attic, um, you know, producing their literature, which of course is you know romantic anyway. But um, but but film is fundamentally collaborative and you have um, folks actually working together to produce this thing that they see as you know really contributing to Egyptian culture as opposing the the kind of cultural domination of Hollywood films of European films um, and of articulating something that is you know genuinely Egyptian um, but that genuinely Egyptian you know uh, uh, thing that they see themselves making is is very is very pluralist. Um, it's very diverse, and and so there's some some really interesting things. And 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 later um, film critics um, sort of reject that and and sort of look down on this period and in, in film um, precisely for that reason. And I'll just take this opportunity to uh, inform our viewers that you Deborah has a wonderful article. I believe it's in Proof Texts that looks at memoirs and. Um, literary depictions of Harat Yehud in Cairo in an earlier period. So I, I recommend that you take a look at that. Um, our final question that we're going to have to end with is by Oli Tbashkin. Um, she says, I know it's difficult to reflect on the, uh, on your, oh, sorry. I know it's difficult to reflect on the reflection of your own amazing work, but given the fact that your book is out and that Hanan Hamad is about to publish a book on Leila Murad, how do you see the study of Egyptian cinema changing in the near future, or maybe more broadly, Egyptian popular culture? So yeah, there, there's a number of work being done. I'm, I'm really looking forward to the publication of the book on, on Leila Murad. Um, I've heard pieces of it along the way, and it, it'll be very exciting. Um, sort of uh, you know companion piece to you know for these two books to be out there around the same time but there's also a, a other scholarship that's happening um, on early Egyptian cinema um, this period that as I just said was is largely been overlooked um, by by critics 
um, in Egypt, and even more so, doubly so in, in English, because there's just not that much writing about Egyptian cinema. Um, and so, uh, so it's, it is an exciting moment to, um, to be part of this conversation and to see this shift um, into really looking at this, this really interesting environment in which film is being produced. Um, and you know the early development, um, some of it you know dipping into the silent era, um, and you know my work that starts with the start of the sound era, um, and um, so there there is a really interesting conversation going on I think on um, you know early Egyptian cinema that I think uh, you know helps provide a a foundation for looking at what's was often considered the golden age of Egyptian cinema. Thank you so much, Deborah. Um, this has really been a wonderful. Uh, talk really just a taste of the fascinating book that you've written. I mean, there's really a very close uh, textual reading of a number of Mizrahi's films. So I would encourage you all to look at that and, and to delve more deeply into the characters and the sort of lost world uh, that he depicts in his films. Um, and I also want to mention that this was part of a, a year long speaker series that we organized in the program in Jewish studies at Penn State on Jews of the Middle East. Um, and my colleague Leo Sternfeld is going to tell us about future events and how to keep track of that. Oh, thank you. Um, this event, like uh, all our events, uh, was recorded and will be on our YouTube channel of uh, the Jewish studies program at Penn State. Um, our next event is on March 10th uh, at noon. It will be a Zoom talk, of course. Uh, we are hosting Dina Danon uh, to talk about her recently published book, The Jews of Ottoman Izmir, A Modern History. Uh, we have uh, two more exciting uh, events after uh, this one. So uh, you can follow us on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. Um, we, we haven't established a TikTok channel, but... <laughs> <laughs> We're thinking of it. Um, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Thank you, Deborah and Michelle, for moderating it and um, keep in touch. <laughs> thank you.